Okay, so um, let's start the morning by thinking about our governments. Let's think about what our governments do to change our lives, the power they have to change our lives. And let's think about the quality of decision-making we all know and expect from government. And nowhere is this question more important than in cities and local governments, because at the level of cities and local government, we are receiving the services that can transform our lives. Now, many people share the expectations of local government as the singer Plan B, Ben, who talks about government basically failing in delivering what people like him needed when he was a child growing up in a council estate in London. And he says it was other people, not government, that changed his life because government doesn't know how to respond. And this is a systemic issue uh, that is extremely important because the potential is so great. And the potential is so great for the simple reason that cities and local governments, 557,000 cities and local governments every year spend four and a half trillion dollars. It's the single biggest budget destined to improve lives, to give services that will make a difference. It's a staggering number. It's such a big number that, that rather than think about that vast number, it's 10% of world GDP, rather than thinking of that number, um, I propose that we start looking at two very little budget items in two cities. In 2011, the city of Minnesota spent four and a half million, million, not trillion, US dollars to buy speaking traffic lights. These traffic lights, they have a button that you press as a blind person in case you get lost. It tells you the address so that you have a backup system that you feel more secure in the city. Exactly the same time, the city of Stockholm spent four and a half million dollars, and they gave Boris here in the stripy shirt uh, on the photo a small navigation aid that looks a little bit like this, and Boris says he now feels 90% less disabled. It's a simple technology, it's a little bit like connecting a, a Wii controller with a, with a GPS device, and it allows him to go anywhere in the city he wants to. Not only does this solution make Boris feel 90% less disabled, it saves the city of Stockholm an estimated $20 million a year at full scale. $20 million the city of Minnesota will every year have to reinvest to keep the blind people blind. It's a technology that is empowering, it's a technology that doesn't require any special infrastructure to be deployed. So what happened there? How can they think in Minnesota that a speaking traffic light is a good public investment? How can they not take the opportunity to, what, to not do what happened in Stockholm, what transformed Boris's life? And the underlying factor of this is that the market is dysfunctional. We have a systemic problem that stops 50, 557,000 cities and local governments, 10% of world GDP, to be allocated in the interest of citizens, for cities to share these kind of solutions to transform lives. So here are some of the underlying issues, and, uh, and these are just some numbers uh, that, that were elaborated in a survey of 60 global cities um, last year. Zero percent of cities publish their problems, their needs, what they need, their intentions. Three percent of cities, or three percent, sorry, of the market is known to decision makers in a city when they buy products, when they make investments. So when they bought the speaking traffic light in Minnesota, they just didn't know that there was another way to do it. They don't have time to look for solutions. Ten percent of public officials say they trust companies they don't already know. Just ten percent meaning that no one does business with someone they don't know. We'll give the contracts to the people we know. 13% of city governments have the possibility, the skills to process new ideas, meaning that even if you presented the speaking traffic light system to Minnesota, they wouldn't trust it, they wouldn't believe it. They would still, um, they would still not implement the better solution. And almost 70% of local governments openly say they only trust contacts they have in formal relationships when they take decisions, when they choose solutions to invest in. So this effectively means, to use the analogy of the blind person, that we're steering 
10% of world GDP destined to improve lives, to provide critical services, blind. 3%. We know nothing about what is happening, how decisions are taken, and certainly those decisions are taken in a rather uninformed way. As a consequence, even the most successful applications we know, for example, the shared bicycle systems, that's probably the one killer application that we've seen in the last years. In 20 years, it's reached 600 cities. Now, that sounds like a lot, but in fact, it's only 0.1% of the market. Imagine in any other business, where you would celebrate success by reaching 0.1% of market share. It's unthinkable. What happened to all the other cities that haven't taken the shared bicycles if they're so successful? What happened there? Why does it keep failing? So the question we have is whether we really must waste this unbelievable resource, whether there really is no way of changing this. And anyone you talk to will tell you probably Look, it's the laws and regulations of procurement that make it impossible. That's the biggest myth. That's like an urban myth in itself. When you look at the laws and regulations for procurement, they allow you to do anything. They're very open, they're very clear. We've just become lazy and complacent about using them, interpreting them. In fact, there is absolutely nothing in the laws that stop you from doing the great things you could be doing. So instead of that, it's the intention that is lacking. It's the intention in our bureaucracies that is lacking to actually do the right thing. It's the motivation to do things differently. It's the lack of openness to look for new solutions and better way of allocating our resources. And in fact, we do this with, with already with 82 cities around the world through our organization CityMart that actually transforms and turns procurement on its head without changing a law, without changing a regulation, simply by doing things differently with the right intention. So we think that cities have to become change leaders. And they have to do this by opening their problems. Opening their problems means that they are beginning not to specify. They get out of the business of specifying what they want to buy. They no longer say, we want to buy a speaking traffic light. Cities should say, we want to help blind people. We want the best way to help blind people. This is such a simple idea that it's almost not worth mentioning here. But it's critical. It makes all the difference in what is happening in our communities. Because bureaucracies defend themselves by specifying in very great detail what a traffic light has to look like. In very, very great detail, believe me. So if we go back to our story of, of what happened in Minnesota and Stockholm, well, in Minnesota, the experts, the engineers of the city, sat down and specified exactly what the speaking traffic light should do. They used industry standards, they described it in great detail, and in the end, there were about five companies that can provide you that result. Why Stockholm came to a different result is that they actually went to the blind people. They went to the community to say, what would help you? Clearly, blind people don't need ramps. They don't need wheelchair access. They need navigation. They need to be able to move around. They defined the problem together with the blind people, and they said, what would really change our lives would be to be free, to be able to leave the house and do what we believe in, what we want to do, and not ask anyone's permission and not use any services. And then the city put that problem to the world's entrepreneurs, innovators, to come up with great solutions, including the one that Boris is now using. The fundamental difference is that the citizen was put first in defining the problem and was part of choosing the best solution. This doesn't cost any money. This means someone goes out of their office and talks to their citizens. Now, if we think about the impact of this, it's staggering. Here in Boston, you see the result of uh, an open problem statement, an open challenge, that asked for reinventing 30,000 manhole covers in the city. 30,000 manhole covers because they're sinking every time a car drives over them. They're destroying cars, they're destroying roads, they cause accidents, and they cost a huge amount of public money. In fact, open problems can save us 10% of the 4.5 trillion annual spending uh, that the governments are putting forward to solve our problems, according to McKinsey. It's a massive resource. Imagine what we could do with $450 billion a year to really transform lives. 
Open problems make governments more responsive. Who of you would have thought that the state of Lagos, the largest city in Africa with more than 21 million people, is using open problems to be more responsive to their citizens? And here's what they've done. They've worked together with citizens to identify that, in fact, video piracy is holding back the uplift, the social and economic growth of one million people in the city working in Nollywood, the world's second largest movie cluster and most productive mu uh, movie industry. They responded to them. They opened up the problem and reacted within months to actually create that transformation. They created a responsive system, an agility of government that previously was not seen possible. The deputy mayor of Barcelona, she's becoming a change maker. She's using open problems to invite the world's entrepreneurs to be part and work side by side with the bureaucrats in her city in another program we're running where we are inviting them to inspire every single decision in the city, opening up a greater part every year of the city's procurement, allowing everyone in the city to see the inner working, the most secret parts of government at work, how problems are solved, how decisions are made, how money is spent. And open problems create opportunity for people like Kat Fletcher. Kat Fletcher is a is a woman who believes that she can transform Brighton into a zero-waste community. And open problems for her are important because she's a social entrepreneur, she's an activist, she's a change maker. She's collecting waste, she creates waste depots, she's building the world's first house made entirely out of waste materials. But she's also joined the city council, she's also on the local university because the city has recognized by opening up decisions they can incorporate her. And these are the people that bring the change. And the government begins to see itself as a facilitator for change. So, we think that she doesn't deserve a speaking traffic light. And if you believe you want to live in a world that is not marked and not defined by speaking traffic lights, but by empowerment, by actual real change, we need to ask of our governments to no longer talk about the solutions, whether we build that building or that building, or whether we build a bridge or whether we like the design. We need to move the discussion to the problems we have. We need to agree on the problems. We need to be part of solving these problems rather than being given the choice between one or two solutions that might be best. We see these solutions are transforming lives. And in fact, these unbelievable resources of 10% of world GDP are going to be triggered and are going to be released by government defining itself as a partner for change rather than a bottleneck. My dream is that the statement we saw at the beginning that our taxpayers' money goes to waste because we don't trust government to have empathy to understand what we need is in fact a very, very sad picture of the world and something we can change. And we're very much encouraged. And if you talk to your cities or if you vote for a politician or if you have someone warning in the opposition, you should ask them, why don't you open up the problem? Why don't you run on a ticket that says, I want to be open. I want to actually make the innermost decisions of government accessible to all. And it works. We're doing this in many, many cities and we believe this is possible. And if anyone tells you that there's a law or a regulation, you know it's a myth. And if they don't believe you that this is a myth, that this is a reality, you're more than welcome to call me, and I'll be more than happy to convince them otherwise. Thank you.